Hello and welcome back to NPTEL, National Program of Technology Enhanced Learning, a joint venture of Indian Institutes of Technology and Indian Institute of Science. As you are aware, these lectures are for students in all the IITs and other engineering colleges and the role of humanities and social sciences in these institutes are uh, quite significant because it adds to the curriculum of engineering students. I am Krishna Barwa. I have been teaching English for the last uh, 14 years uh, in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Guwahati. We are presently in the lecture series Language and Literature and this module is module uh, 3 of the series titled uh, history of English literature. We are going to do uh, lecture 6 of this module titled the Victorians. Let us have a recap of the previous lecture. In lecture 1, if you remember, we had talked about the need for understanding the background of each literary uh, output and uh, how it adds to the study of English literature. Uh, we want you to be introduced to the spirit of the age, the currents which go in the age and that helps and adds to your appreciation of text. It may, we may go back to Saucer's time, we may go back to the Renaissance, we may go back to the Romantic age and in doing so, we try to see how some of the characteristics add to the development of new uh, trends which come into the literary times of, of each age. In lecture 1, we had done Anglo-Saxon literature, the role of Saucer as the father of English uh, literature, of English poetry as well as prose and all the poetry which was there was earnest and somber, it was pervaded with fatalism and religious feelings. In lecture 2, we covered the age of Shakespeare, a great giant who had dominated the entire age which was the age of Elizabethans, where we had the precursors to Shakespeare, to Marlowe and the University Wits. In poetry, we had Sidney as well as Spencer and where human dignity of human reason, the, mean, uh, the means by which we could interpret man and nature. While we were in module 3, Milton and his times, we have seen how another great giant in English literature, Milton towered conspicuously, each was representative of the age, Shakespeare and Milton and together they formed a suggestive commentary upon the two forces that rule literature. One is the, the force of impulse and the force of fixed purpose. In lecture 4, we did the Augustan age and where we have found from the 18th century and the neoclassical age, the age of reason and uh, how we have to see the poetical works, how for the first time we must chronicle the triumph of English prose during this time. And here it was during this time that we encountered for the first time the history of the books about reforms, about arguments, about ideas, about facts. The newspaper, the magazine, the periodical which will have great trends even in Victorian age, you will find how in this century too. I mean in this age too, it had the beginnings of that and how it had developed. Especially the characteristics of Augustan poetry was uh, a lot of decorum, a lot of irony as well as the imitation of the classics. And the transition between the Augustan period and the Romantic period was a drastic shift in literary ideals. And when we went to the Romantic age, we will see how uh, the uh, view of the life in urban society from that found in the Queen Annie writers and shifts in the view of nature and function of poetry. And the poetry has for its major function the expression of the poet's emotion and the relation of the poem to the poet. That is how it developed into the Romantics and that was the beginning of the 19th century. And no label can accurately describe a period which was so rich and so abundant as the Romantic period. We did this in lecture 5 last time and it is surely and definitely a widening of the imaginative horizon, a sharpening of 
emotional sensibility, horizons were untrammeled, almost it was a take off from the renaissance from the time of Shakespeare and a profound shift in sensibility and especially in its intensity and in its imagination. And in this return to nature, we had the great key uh, uh, poets Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, Shelley, Keats, Scott, Austin, who were the prose writers Lamb and De Quincey. Now, we come to the history of English literature in this module to lecture 6, which is the Victorian, which is equally interesting, right? And especially for you engineers, you will find that somewhere or the other, reason plays a big part here, the role of social responsibility, the role of, of uh, how you understand nature, how you understand life, what, are, what is realism, these are the things which were explored and uh, being written about. Well, so the Victorian age from 1850 from the time Victoria, Queen Victoria came to the throne to her that in 1900, it is a long period almost 63 years and what was the uh, where the characteristics which rule this age. On the surface, we find that democracy just now we were talking about liberty, fraternity, equality which were the guiding forces at the time of roman romantics and we find that democracy as a form as a political form and the long struggle of the Anglo-Saxons for personal liberty is settled. And the meaning of liberty therefore, is which was being questioned and analyzed all throughout these ages has been almost settled. The house of common becomes a ruling power in England. So, here a series of new reform bills comes in and uh, sues for themselves the man who shall represent them. So, monarchy is completely uh, uh, you know uh, being overlooked by uh, overturned by, by democracy. Second, because it is an age of democracy, it is an age of popular education too and of religious tolerance of growing brotherhood and of profound social unrest. Because of the printing press, because of all the things where pamphlets and newspapers and social awareness were disseminated. Therefore, you find it was the age of awareness too. It was an age comparative peace, if you look into the ways that evolution had take place, the American war of independence had just been over, social equality and universal brotherhood and its rapid progress in all the arts and sciences and in mechanical invention. It was almost an uh, overwhelming sort of development in all fields. So, the reign of Queen Victoria from 1837 to 1901 included a period of enormous political, social and cultural innovation and change. You have to look into the background, political background. The Victorians made great advances in science, technology and the arts, sought creative solutions to social problems and created a body of literature that continues to fascinate and inspire readers, artists and scholars. Uh, I think you know that this was the growth of British imperialism, where they explored boundaries, they were uh, when the shores were almost uh, stopped in the American continent, they came here to India, to Africa, to New Zealand, to different parts of Africa and you find that imperialism, uh, British imperialism took it came to the fore and as if the, the sun never set on the British empire and therefore, you find literature also try to uh, uh, express those uh, that age of optimism and also different ways that one could look into the world. During the Victorian age, England changed as much as dramatically as it had in all its previous history. There was a lot of change, there was a lot of innovation. It was here in this 19th century that England reached its height as a world imperial power. Changes in industrial production techniques had a profound impact on almost all aspects of life for every class of citizen. Maybe the working class, the, the, the role of the working class were also questioned, were they uh, exploited, were they being overthrown or were they being uh, used for imperial gain. Unregulated industrialization created great prosperity for a lucky few, but a great misery for the masses which we find in Charles Dickens novels and other writers. The early Victorian period, let us look into it, is marked by two major non-literary events. First was 
the public railways expanded on an unprecedented scale. So, communication was very quick and people could reach one destination to the other. Second, the British Parliament passed a reform bill, which was a landmark in itself. Like Manchester and Liverpool, voting rights to reflect growing population. And in 1832, reform bill marked for many Victorians the beginning of a new age of political power, unlike they had ever experienced. The 1830s, we are going into the social as well as into the political history before we come to the literature of the period. This is necessary for you to understand. Therefore, as I told you before in every lecture that we had done, in studying literature, it, it is always uh, good to study also the, uh, the literary, uh, uh, the social, the political undercurrents, the way that each acts upon the creative uh, literature of the time. Well, so this became known as the time of troubles, big people did not take things for granted, they began to revolt, they began to question, working conditions were deplorable for the majority of people, including women and children who worked in mines and factories. So, there was a sense of uh, literature where uh, novels, essays came out, they talked about this type of exploitation and there was a lot of social responsibility which went into the making of literature. And the literature of this time period often focused on the plight of the poor and the new urban reality of industrial England. So, it was not pastoral as it was in the Romantic era or maybe in the Renaissance, where people went to the villages and where one tried to find in the landscape, it was more uh, concentrating on the urban reality, the realism which was there in urban England, the two Englands that of wealthy and that of the poor. The 1850s, when we come to the 1850s, there were too many a time of optimism, because on the surface industry seemed to be the promise of prosperity was there, it was a time of peace. So, too was England proud of his science and technology, uh, because it was uh, evidenced by the crystal palace centerpiece of the great exhibition of 1851. Among other scientific works of the time, we have to remember, we will come back, back to that later. Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species and The Descent of Man seem to challenge all previous thinking about creation and man's special role in the world. So, man was man centric, man was just one among many cre creatures who existed as a product of a long evolutionary history. So, the mid Victorian period when we come to that would ultimately see often contrary forces, a lot of contradictions, a lot of paradoxes like the promise of progress, yet the emptiness of long held beliefs that could come to a head during the final decades of the Victorian era. Well, let me quote a uh, uh, line here, it is not by the monk in his cell or the saint in his closet and by the valiant worker in humble sphere and in dangerous days that the landmarks of liberty are pushed forward. These words by the vigorous social critic William Gregg apply with special force to the first half of the 19th century. Now, when we look into the social history, now, now we look into the two names which dominated, one was William Cobbett and one was Francis Place. And uh, who did an equally valiant work for industrial population of the city. He was a tailor, but even then he was prosperous and he also added to the literary output of the time. The two great revolution that had come in with the new century proved to be reactionary forces in English life. And from the reformers point of view, the industrial revolution while aggravating the symptoms of distress had appealed strongly to the basic instincts of the commercial class as a new class came in and they were trying to, uh, to outdo the aristocracy by new, new uh, ways of uh, imbibing a new culture. And therefore, many have said that the Victorian culture, you know, it was an age of priggishness of some put on uh, decorums and some put, put on conventions. The French revolution had created distaste for progressive measures in the minds of timid statesmen. Comparatively, it, the whole age may not unfairly describe as one of peaceful uh, activity. The middle class citizen groaned under the burden of heavy taxation, but after all it was he who already began to reap some of the advantages of the industrial revolution. I told you that on the whole the one best of at the close of the war was the country gentleman. The cessation of the war brought little elevation 
and the year from 1815 to 1832 were very bleak years in annals of the London poor. At Charing Cross, we see Francis Place, we, whom we had just mentioned, had his famous library. He was a businessman, but he had at the back room, all tucked away at the back of his shops, a beautiful library of pamphlets, journals, books, and all documentations of that time, of every time of political and social unrest. So, when we go into this intellectual developments, yet it is recorded of this age that intellectual activities were so numerous. There was quite a revolution in scientific thought, we have seen that following upon the works of Darwin and his school with an immense outburst of social and political theor theorizing, right, which was represented by Herbert Spencer, John Stuart Mill. We have uh, Marx, we will have uh, different political thinkers who will come later. This in turn produced a new hunger for intellectual food and resulted in a great increase in the productions of the press and of other more durable pieces of literature. So, the printing press was at its highest activity. While Place, Corbett Owen and Elizabeth Fry were working in the various ways, in the different ways of disseminating knowledge, we find Charles Dickens, born in one of the stormiest of years in 1812, was spending his unhappy boyhood in London and passing through experiences which were to inspire him throughout his life. Many of you must have read his novels and you will see that the background of all his novels were actually autobiographical, everything that he had seen in his life, the way that uh, children were being exploited, the way that the conditions of, uh, of industry was so poor was all written by Charles Dickens. Charles Kingsley was also a schoolboy at Bristol, had his first taste of social unrest of the time when he witnessed the fierce riots in that city at the time of the reform bill. So, there is no better guide to early Victorian London, if you want to understand what was London like. It was not only from the pamphlets, from the newspapers, you read the novels of Charles Dickens, then Charles Dickens and the upper stratum of London society are more faithfully pictured by Thackeray, who was also one of his uh, peers by reason of his better knowledge. The early years saw the awakening of democratic London and therefore, when we see the meaning of democratic London, democracy with all its ideals of individualism, we find that collectivism and individualism were two streams of thought crossing and recrossing one another in writing, in the writings of that time. Even in John Stuart Mill, not to talk of John Stuart Mill, we have the other essays of that time. Therefore, when we try to see the Victorian period as a whole, what two factors stand out too prominently? One was the steady advance of democratic ideals, very true, and the progress of scientific thought. Both of these powerfully affected and were affected in their turn by the literature of the age. For many, the late Victorian period was merely an extension, at least on the surface of the affluence of the preceding years. There was the social and political theory, then we have the political writing of authors like Karl Marx and Frederick Engels empowered the working class to imagine itself in control of the industry that made it possible. The final decade of the Victorian period, which was the just a preview of the modernist periods, which we will do in lecture 7, marked a high point both of English industry and imperial control and of challenges to that industry and imperialism. I had repeatedly told you in these lectures that when we do each separate age, Please try to see how one age goes into the other. It is not that one age completely is different from the other, but there are tenets which are so similar and there are tenets which go against it, which ultimately lead to new developments. Even while British empire building continued with great energy in Africa and India, in England many were starting to see the beginning of the end of the era. Gone was trust in Victorian propriety and morality towards the end. So, the snobbishness, this prudishness, there was a revolt against that, there was a reaction against that. Instead, many writers stuck to the end of century post, weary yet with optimism of forward progress. This is a painting by uh, Ford Maddox Brown and the literary characteristics which we look into now, let us see the 19th century is often, often regarded as a high point in British literature. 
not only in Buddhist literature, we find that in other countries such as France, the United States and Russia, we have great thinkers, we have great idealists, we have great uh, philosophers who have contributed to the history of ideas. First, though the age produced many poets, the two who deserve to rank among the greatest nevertheless was Tennyson and Browning. But nevertheless, this is emphatically an age of prose. The age of newspaper, the magazine, the periodical and the modern novel and the novel in this age fills a place which the drama held in the days of Elizabeth. So, let us go back into all these preceding ages and we see that each age had its distinctive uh, characteristics does not it. And we find that the age of uh, Shakespeare was the age of drama as well as poetry. We find the classical age of prose and we find here especially in the romantic period the age of poetry again and not only poetry also of different pamphlets. But here it is even though poetry had different uh, uh, big names to it, the novel in this age fills a place in which the drama held in the days of Elizabeth. And never before in any age or language has the novel appeared in such numbers in such perfection. There was a huge reading public, there was the huge peop, uh, I mean output of novel writing and there was because it was more or less commercial. So, the second marked characteristic of the age was this definite moral purpose. It was not art for art sake, it was almost literature was for life sake or for some purpose. And both in prose and in poetry seems to depart from the purely artistic standard of art for art sake and to actuate it by definite moral purpose as you see in Tennyson, we see in Browning, we see in the works of Carlyle, we see in the works of John Ruskin. Perhaps for this reason the Victorian age is emphatically also an age of realism age of uh, uh, prose, age of uh, the novel rather than of romance. So, there was advances in printing technology, publishers could provide more text of various kinds to more people and even Charles Dickens he published his work not in book first, but in surreal forms short fiction therefore, tried during the Victorian period and novel was perhaps the most prevalent genre of the time. Its morality nearly all observers of the Victorian age are struck by the extreme deference to the conventions. It was thought indecorous for a man to smoke in public or a lady to ride a bicycle. So, many people thought that there was the age was a sort of uh, a posier right. To a great extent the new morality was a natural revolt against the grossness of the earlier residency. Tennyson is the most conspicuous example in poetry creating the priggishly complacent Sir Galahad and King Arthur Dickens perhaps the most representative of the Victorian novelist. But there was this revolt as I told you, many writers protested against the deadening effects of the conventions. Carlyle, Matthew Arnold in their different accents were loud in their denunciations, Thackeray never tired of satirizing the snobbishness of the age and Browning's mannerisms were so intellectual and there was indirect challenge to the diction of the age. It remained for Thomas Hardy later as a novelist to pull aside the Victorian veil and shutters and with the large tolerance of the master to regard man action with open gauge. While prose fiction was the most widely as we have said circulated kind of writing, poetry retained its iconic status as very high literature. Poets of the period ranged widely in the subject matter, some sought to revive mythic themes arterial region for example, while others turned a critical eye to the industrial abuses of the present. Well, so we come to the poetry of the time, the poets of the Victorian age and first to address would be Alfred Tennyson from 1801 to 1892. Poet laureate at the death of Wordsworth in 1850, Tennyson stood at the summit of poetry throughout the entire Victorian period. In this wonderful variety of his verse, he says all the qualities of England's greatest poems. So, this is where we find that it is almost like uh, memory 
memories of the preceding ages come back in his poetry. The dreaminess of Spencer in that of the Elizabethan age, the majesty of Milton, the grandeur of Milton is there, the natural simplicity of Wordsworth of the romantic age, the fantasy of Blake, pre-romantics and Coleridge, the melody of Keats and Shelley, very much like Keats and Shelley, especially in the rhythm of his poetry, the narrative vigor of Scott and Byron. Perhaps the most love of all Tennyson work is the ideals of the king and in memoriam, which on account of both his theme and exquisite workmanship is one of the few immortal names that were not born to die. Everyone associate Tennyson with in memoriam. The immediate occasion of this remarkable poem was Tennyson's profound personal grief at the death of his friend Helen. The ideals of the king ranks among the greatest of Tennyson's later works. Its general subject is the Celtic legends of King Arthur and his knights of the round table and the chief source of the material is Mallory's Maud the Arthur. He is remembered for different different poems, the dramatic lyric Ulysses, Locksley Hall, Sir Galahad, one of the most famous in the series is Enoch Arden. Yet the theme of each is the orderly development of law, whatever the theme may be, we find that there is a law that governs the, his world whether it is the natural or the spiritual world. Tennyson is essentially the artist, he used to take, care, yeah, take great care in the craftsmanship of his poems, no other in his age studied the art of poetry so constantly as he. The strong and noble spirit of his life is reflected in one of his best known poems, Crossing the Bar, which was written in his 81st year towards the end, which he desires to be placed at the end of his collected words. Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me, and may there be no morning in the bar when I put out to sea. This is just an excerpt from the poem. We next come to the other uh, no, uh, great poet of the time, Robert Browning, 1812 to 1889. And Brown's place in English literature, Browning's place in English literature will be better appreciated by comparison with his friend Tennyson. And Browning is as much introspective, as much obscure and as much intellectual when compared to uh, Tennyson's transparency or his different ways of uh, how he narrated his poems. In one respect at least these poets are in perfect accord, each finds in love the supreme purpose and meaning of life. So, if we ask you to study uh, the Victorian poets, it will be natural for you to pick up either Tennyson or Browning, right? And you will find the contrast which is there in each one's style of uh, versification. Tennyson is first the artist and then the teacher, but with Browning, the message is always the important thing and his careless to careless or the form in which it is expressed. Again, Tennyson is under the influence of the Romantic Revival as we have seen and chooses his subjects daintily, whether and, and in Browning, net, in, uh, Browning's net takes in calmly and ugly, su ugly subjects with equal pleasure and aims to show that truth lies hidden in both the evil and the good. And many see that Browning can be compared even with Shakespeare in the way that he analyzed human nature, the psychology of the psyche, the psychology of the mind, the psychology of human actions and therefore, even though they are very dissimilar, many term that in the understanding of human nature, he is equal to almost Shakespeare. And, but it was the obscurity of his style that always earned him a little bit of, of uh, popularity. His field was the individual soul, never exactly alike in any two men, it was so varied and it was so deep and he sought to express the hidden motives and principles which govern individual action, different mental associations. Uh, as students, I would want you to read Browning's poems on artists, on different uh, characters of Dharanasa and you will find that these are interesting ideas of how human nature unfolds. No other poet is so completely, so consciously, so magnificently a teacher of man. Browning is the most stimulating poet in English literature for his joy of life, his robust faith and his invincible optimism. His first known work Pauline 
was in 1833 and later he had written Paracelsus and not till Sordello was published in 1840 did he attract attention enough to be denounced for the obscurity and vagaries of his time. Robert Browning is remembered also for another uh, instance. Six years later in 1846 he suddenly became famous not because he published Bells and Pomegranates, but because he eloped with the best known literary woman in England Elizabeth Barrett whose fame was for many years both before and after her marriage much greater than Browning or Tennyson and then who was at first considered superior even than Tennyson. For 15 years Browning and his wife lived in Pisa and in Florence. We will come back to Elizabeth Barrett later, but with the publication of the ring and the book in 1868 he was at last recognized by his countrymen as one of the greatest of English poets. So, though he had remained in Italy for most of the time, though Italy offered him an honored resting place, England claimed him of her own and he lies buried beside Tennyson in Westminster Abbey. Here we have Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Brown picture of them. Indeed, all his poems may be divided into three classes. Why do we read Browning? It is not only because of the great insight he had into human nature, but also because of the way that he brought dramatic characteristics into poetry and that was called a dramatic monologue or the dramatic lyrics. And it can be divided into three classes, the pure dramas like Stra uh, Strafford and a blot in the scutcheon, dramatic narratives like Pippa Passes and dramatic lyrics like the last ride together. You will really enjoy reading this lyrics which are short poems expressing some strong personal emotion. And his best known volumes contain, contain the dramatic lyrics, then the dramatic romances and lyrics, men and women, dramatis persona suggest how strong the dramatic element is in all his work. So, this dramatic power which we find in the poetry of the time lies in depicting what he himself calls the history of the soul. His range is enormous and brings all sorts and conditions of men under analysis. What type of man did he analyze? The magician in Ed Fogler, please read that too. It is a beautiful, beautiful dramatic lyric monologue. The artist in Andrea del Sarto, what is the, the, the creative process in the artist? My last does is a wonderful poem. The early Christian in a death in the desert, the Arab horseman in Mutkia, the sailor in Hervikil, the medieval knight in Child Roland, the Hebrew in Saul, the Greek in Balasustian's adventure, monster in Caliban, the immortal dead in Carsis. You can see the variety of people that he, uh, that uh, themes that he uh, analyzed. Pippa passes one of the longer uh, uh, poems, aside from his rare poetical qualities is a study of unconscious influence. It is a beautiful poem and the idea of the poem was suggested to Browning while listening to a gypsy girl singing in the woods near his home. I think most of you know this. The years at the spring and days at the morn, mornings at seven, the hillsides dew pearl, the larks at, uh, on the wing, the snails on the thorn, gods in his heaven, all's right with the world. You must have come across this lens, but never knew that it was Robert Browning. And the ring and the book is Browning's uh, masterpiece. It is an immense poem twice as long as Paradise Lost, yes, and a series of monologues in which the same story is retold nine different times by different actors in the drama. So, when we look at Browning and Tennyson, we see always that it is the contrast with Tennyson. And the contrast is almost striking when we remember that Browning's essentially scientific attitude was taken by a man who refused to study science. Tennyson whose work is always artistic never studied art, but was devoted to the sciences. While Browning whose work was seldom artistic in form thought that art was the most suitable subject for men's study. Okay? So, it was almost like the Kunstel Roman, the how the creative process works in a man and how he went into the different ways of the creative process, whether it was in the musician, whether it was in the artist, whether it was in different uh, types of men. So, their respective messages we find, Tennyson's message reflects the growing order of the age, where there was need of this order and is summed up in the word law. In his view, the individual will must be suppressed, the self must always be subordinate and occasionally it suggests open her in its mixture of faith and pessimism, while Browning is the triumph of the individual will over all the obstacle. They make interesting contrast and therefore, Victorian age is dominated by these two 
stalwarts where one says the individual will has to be suppressed, another says I can and I will. Therefore, the different trends which goes into the Victorian age. Browning is therefore, far more radically English than is Tennyson. Because of his invincible will and optimism, Browning is at present regarded as the poet who has spoken the strongest word of faith to an age of doubt. Even now, he is the most popular poet apart from Shakespeare, Keats and Byron. And we find that among the minor poets, we had already mentioned Elizabeth Barrett Browning occupies perhaps the highest place in popular favor, exquisite love poems, especially the sonnets from the Portuguese and this exquisite romance of their love is preserved in her sonnets from the Portuguese. I will just uh, quote a few lines, how do I love thee let me count the ways, this is a famous uh, sonnet from sonnets from the Portuguese. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach, when filling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee with the breath, smile tears of all my life, and if God chose I shall but love thee better after that. We have now another group of poets who had gone against the trend. We have Dante Gabriel Rossetti 1828 to 1882, he was distinguished both as a painter and as a poet. So, the role of aesthetics come here towards the end of uh, the Victorian age, the role of art, the role of architecture, the role of painting, visual art, visual culture. He was a leader in the pre raphaelite movement and it seems at first that this trend in uh, poetry was apart from Victor, uh, Victorian literature. It is concerned primarily with neither democratic ideals nor with scientific and philosophical problems. Its chief concern was with art and simplicity and exquisite spiritual quality are characteristics of the ideals of the pre raphaelite We have Christina Rossetti, William Morris who were trying to show most inter interesting combination of literary man and artist. Poetry for them was not concerned with dialectics, but with aesthetics, with form, with beauty, with sight, with how you look at the world. We come to Swinburne again chronologically, the last of the Victorian poets. Of course, we have Matthew Arnold, Arthur, Hugh Claw, etc. But even then Swinburne as an artist in tactic, we have found his Atlanta in Caledon, a beautiful lyric drama model on the Greek tragedy. And these are great giants, we cannot say that they are minor poets, they in their own turn had brought in different at, uh, attributes of Victorian poetry. Matthew Arnold, when you look at him as a poet, as a critic, we find that he has the mood of doubt and sorrow, intellectual by his crystal clear style, his scientific spirit of inquiry and compassion. Arnold's literary work divides itself into three periods, the poetical, the critical and the practical, especially known for his essays in criticism. Approach literature with the single desire to find what he said that culture is the best which has been taught and said in the world, his famous lines. Now, the most representative therefore, Victorian makers of verse, who were they? Tennyson, Robert Browning or Elizabeth Barrett Browning while lacking the fire and air of the romantics had in their own way excelled in a breadth of outlook and variety of method. We have seen how they had experimented with form. While in prose the Victorian age is second to none for its rich complexity and veined humanity. Well, so as we had said earlier, the most popular form of literature was the novel. Victorian age is known as the age of the novel and the novelist responded with a will and who dominates the entire Victorian age and especially the, the area of novel is Charles Dickens 1812 to 1870, but for the motley multitude that poured through the streets, for the whole and corner places of the city, for London as an incomprehensible, terrifying, fascinating, delightful personality, this is from Compton Rickett. Every brick and stone alive with tragic humor, Dickens remains unrivaled. If you want to see London of the times, then Dickens is unrivaled. He was poor, he was brought out as a suffering child, was helping to support a syphilis family by pasting labels on blacking bottles, sleeping under the counter like a homeless cat and once a week timidly approaching the big prison where his father was confined. In 1836, his Pickwick was published and his life was changed as if a magician had waved his wand over him. This is Dickens. 
acknowledged literary hero of England. So, the acknowledged literary hero of England is Charles Dickens. His third novel is Nicholas Nickleby, indeed in most of his remaining words. The principles of his first two book giving a smirk, many people thought that he was writing in the comic veil, but the comic veil was a uh, veil uh, of course, of the irony that a satire on the living condition, injustice and suffering on the other. He was the idol of immense audiences which gathered to applaud him wherever he appeared. He enjoyed the popularity of his time and there is also the striking contrast between the novelist and the poets that while the whole tendency of the age was towards realism, it was precisely by emphasizing oddities and absurdities, okay, the foibles by making caricatures rather than characters that Dickens first achieved his popularity. Many thought that it was in the comic vein as I have already told you. Thereafter, no matter what he wrote, Dickens was labeled a humorist, mingling humor and pathos, tears and laughter as we find them in life itself. He introduced very odious, very evil characters and made vice more hateful by contrasting it with innocence and virtue. His famous masterpiece is David Copperfield, then we have a tale of two cities, we have Bleak House, Dombey and Son, Old Curiosity Shop, Hard Times, Great Expectations. It was not only that he wrote uh, novels of, of his times, he also wrote holiday stories. After the year 1843, he devoted one literary work to furnish a Christmas story for his readers. Famous of them is the Cricket on the Heart, the Chimes and above all the unrivaled Christmas Carol. Yes, you should read those stories and you will find that it really gives a pristine beauty to the festival. Next to him was William Makepeace Thackeray 1811 to 1863 and he depicts situation of a more middle class. He was well brought out, he came from rich affluent family just the contrast with, with Dickens. He is first of all a realist who paints life as he sees it. He also is satirical influenced doubtless by 18th century literature. But many people say that he is a master of a pure and simple English and many people say that especially in this age, in the Victorian age, the role of the identity of men, the Englishman as it is, may be trying to show in his imperialism or in his writings in the way that the national identity is being shown was also reflected in the writings of the time. And therefore, the English uh, uh, flavor or the English tone of temper was being shown very markedly in Thackeray. The same difference between the two novelists, however, is not one of environment, but one of temperament. It was not till just as we contrast uh, Tennyson and Browning, we also play side by side uh, Brown, uh, Dickens and Thackeray and his Vanity Fair uh, that he began to be recognized as one of the great novelists of his day, the advent of the historical novel. Then we have Pendenis in 1850, Henry Esmond in 1852 and the New Combs in 1855. We also have uh, Charles de Baudre and Emily Bronte, the sisters, while Dickens and Thackeray were vitalizing town life, we find Charles de Bronte in her lonely northern home was finding literary outlet for the aspiration and longings of sensitive insurgent womanhood, the women writers who were writing about provincial life her famous novel Jane Eyre and Villette, which was tragic in its own form, but you find a more remarkable personality was her sister Emily Bronte in whom the wildness and loneliness of the Yorkshire moors, the heats seem to become personified. Her book, the only book that she wrote, Weathering Hearts is a classic in 1847 in sheer force of imagination. I hope you read it, it has been filmed many times and it is a classic by its own in sheer romanticism, in sheer passion, in sheer uh, involvement with the characters, you will find that it is unrivaled, especially the character of Catherine and Heathcliff, an elemental passions, but controlled by an uncompromising artistic sense. These are some pictures of the Bronte sisters, uh, Emily in the middle, Charles de Bronte. Other novelists were equally also up to the mark. Samuel Butler produced novels satirizing the Victorian ethos. Then we have Robert Louis Stevenson, you may be very familiar with them. Louis Carroll, I think many of you have read Alice Adventures in Wonderland, Through the Looking Glass, George Eliot, pen name of Mary Ann Evans. She was the first novelist to lay the stretch wholly upon character 
rather than incident. The meal on the floor, Silas Marner, I, I, I have a doubt that you have read this novelist or read the stories, but even then I hope you will go and look them up in your free time, middle March. Yet, as we said that it was a huge uh, output of novelists. We have Elizabeth Gaskell, we have Wilkie Collins, George Meredith, Anthony Trollope. By the end of the period, the novel was considered not only the premier form of entertainment, but also the primary means of analyzing and offering solutions to social and political problems. We have at the end of it, who stands on the borderline between the modernist as well as the uh, Victorians, Thomas Hardy, who in his later years has returned to first writing, interesting and vital as his poetry is, it is as a storyteller of life. In Thomas Hardy's profoundly pessimistic novels are all set in the harsh, punishing Midland country he called Wessex, imaginary name that he gave the southwest of London. As he said, happiness is an occasional episode in the general drama of pain, a rare insight into simple uncultured elemental nature. Nature comes out as a, a different dominating character, it is almost like an environmental text. Eco critics nowadays read his novels and Wordsworth's poetry from the standpoint of eco criticism and he depicts the primal things of life to dally with all world customs, to paint men and women as victims or inevitable outcome of certain environmental causes. That was the aim of Hardy, his famous novels Greenwood Tree, Under the Greenwood Tree, Far from the Madding Crowd, Deaths of the Dear Rivers. So, now we come to towards the end, essays of the Victorian age who are the who are a huge uh, great icons in their own place, Macaulay, Carlyle, Arnon, Newman and Russell. So, when we look at a closer approximation of literature to social life, it is very marked in the Victorian era. Kingsley wrote passionate social tracts in the guise of a story, Thackeray whom you know as a novelist is known in English literature as an essayist, his English humorist and the four Georges among the finest essays of the 19th century. Of course, we have Carlyle who wrote about the philosophy of clothes after excursions into German literature and European history, his Sarta Resartus and his heroes and hero worships were landmarks in the, in the time and his work belongs only in part to the Victorian era probably, but with the exception of Sarta Resartus, his most characteristic work was published during that time. One of the most notables are heroes and hero worship. We come to John Ruskin who had influenced so many writers in his time, who had influenced almost uh, the uh, trend in looking at life and art in different way. And he did a great job in bringing the plastic arts and the art of architecture before the general reader. So, we see another current which is coming in from the pre Raphaelites. We have John Raskin who talks about painting, who talks about the exchanges between the visual and the verbal and the relation between art and nature. The imaginative and ethical influence of great art was expatiated upon by Raskin in his famous modern painters than the seven lamps of architecture and stones of Venice. With all the illustrative eloquence his style would give it students of design, students of art, you might go and read this and you will find it very, very revealing. His later writings form unto this last, you remember that this was a text which had influenced Gandhi a lot. Raskin starting as critic of the art of painting turns in the new century to the more complex art of life and no man of letters has tackled industrial problems with greater insight and more brilliant suggestiveness than he has done. Among the religious writers of the age, we have to mention John Henry Newman. He was a member of the Oxford movement. His most widely read work, Apologia Pro Vita Sua, was written in answer to an unfortunate attack by Charles Kingley. Then we have John Eddington Simons, author of the Renasa in Italy. And of many critical essays, we have Walter Pitter, again another aesthetic uh, icon whose appreciations and numerous other works mark him as one of our best literary critics. Many of them say that he was, he took off from Ruskin and Leslie Slaven, uh, Stephen, famous for his work on the monumental, monumental dictionary of national biography.
and for his hours in a library a series of impartial and excellent criticism. So, therefore, we find just now we mentioned Cardinal Newman and we find that the religious and ethical thought the export movement as it was called was the most what noteworthy advance and therefore, we have a new education X where making a certain measure of education compulsory rapidly produced an enormous reading public and the spinning of printing paper increased the demand for books, so that the production was multiplied. So, we come to the end where we mentioned the scientist among the most famous writers of the age were the scientists Lyle, Darwin, Huxley, Spencer, Tyndall and Wallace a wonderful group of men whose works having exercised an incalculable influence on our life and literature. This is nearer to your stream, nearer to your work and you will find that the epoch making book Darwin's origin of speeches, the theory of evolution which had such an impact on all uh, uh, areas of study, Wallace's Dar uh, Darwinism and Huxley's autobiography. Especially towards the end of the Victorian period, let us not forget the playwrights like George Bernard Shaw and Oscar Wilde began to reflect in an increasingly satirical way the pretentious values and behavior that they saw Victorian life. So, it was a sort of satire, but it was through the vein of comedy. Musical theatre in Britain at that time culminated in the famous series of comic operas by Gilbert and Sullivan, you must have heard about them and were followed in the 1890s with the first Edwardian musical comedies. The first musical comedies were there, it came into prominence during this time and Oscar Wilde became the leading poet and dramatist of the late Victorian period, Wilde's plays in particular stand apart from the many now forgotten plays of Victorian times, even now he is read like George Bernard Shaw who goes into some of uh, his plays goes into the modern period some into the uh, Victorian and Wilde's 1895 comic masterpiece the importance of being honest is still regarded as a mastery master, masterpiece of wit and paradoxical wisdom. So, summing up we see that the Victorian age was not one, but single or unified because it was an age of paradox and power it was a huge long period 63 years approximately and the Catholicism of the Oxford movement you have seen the rise of utilitarianism, socialism, Darwinism, scientific agnosticism we are all in our own ways characteristically Victorian, we have the profiting writings of Carlyle and Ruskin, we have the criticism of Arnold, we have the poetry of, uh, of uh, Tennyson and Browning and the realism of George Eliot and George Barnard Shaw. Many may correct our judgment of this as a material age and looking at the literature which expresses our faith in men may judge the Victorian age to be on the whole the noblest and most inspiring in the history of the world. The Victorian age was characterized therefore, by rapid change and developments in nearly every sphere, whether it was in medical, scientific uh, and technological knowledge and therefore, over time this rapid transformation deeply affected the country's mood. So, when we study this age let us look into this background about the changes which are there and let us see how these changes also reflected in the uh, literature of the period. With the benefit of hindsight, we can see the 1890s as a transitional phase. We will be going into the next phase in the next lecture, the modernist period and between the optimism and promise of the Victorian period and the modernist movement and during which artists began to challenge just how genuine that optimism and promise had been in the first place. For discussion therefore, let us see how, what were the different trends which Victorian age was characterized by how it was by rapid change and developments and only in that sphere should we be able to look into this age. It is a vast age and therefore, it would be nice to see how in every field whether it is in poetry, whether it is in a novel, whether in the essay, in the, uh, in the, in the scientific field we find that there have been many strides. If you want to look into Tennyson's life you will have to see that it is itself a open book and we have to see his safe works, how he develops. If you look into Browning, 
He is almost compared with Shakespeare. We see his dramatic lyrics, his dramatic monologues, beautiful presentation portraits of man. And you can almost uh, say that Freud had also written during this time and uh, uh, psychoanalysis and the way that people thought about man and relationships was something that he had done extraordinary. And Dickens of course, was uh, absolutely uh, different, different. What experiences in Dickens life are reflected in his novel? You can look at each novel that it is autobiographical in the way that he relates the realistic portrayals of different characters which are there. George Eliot, we read Silas Manor and make a brief analysis and we find that all these have different ways of how they, uh, he or she uh, made the characters, the style and move. Ruskin of course, in different ways of modern society, in the way that Ruskin brought in uh, the way the exchanges between, between art and literature, between architecture and the aesthetic movement and the salient features of the Victorian age. I hope you have enjoyed this lecture. Next, we will go into the modernist. Refer text, Edward Albert, most of it has come from Compton Rickert, G. M. Travelin, English Social History, a survey of six centuries. It is a necessary book, which allows you to understand the social history of the time. David Dyess, A Critical History of English Literature, William J. Long's English Literature, its history and its significance. Thank you.